On this episode on Page of Crime, we will dive into the brutal murders of four members of the Clutter family in the small city of Holcomb, Kansas, which held at the time a population of 270 people, would shock the nation when this story hit the news. The Clutter family murders is one of the bloodiest murders in Kansas history. At the time of the tragic event on November 1959, Herb Clutter, his wife Bonnie Mae Clutter, and their teenage children Nancy Mae Clutter and Kenyon Neil Clutter would be found murdered in their home. The Clutter family of six were farmers. They lived in a farmhouse which had 14 rooms and acres of land surrounding it. Herbert Clutter, 48, was born May 24, 1911. He had made a fair deal of money using new technology to grow wheat. The Clutter farm and ranch covered almost 1,000 acres in one of the richest wheat areas. He was also interviewed by the New York Times for what was considered a pioneering move at the time. He was known as a good, honest and reasonable person, who was well respected with a good heart. He treated everyone fairly, he had employed farmhands and paid them well. In 1954, President Eisenhower appointed him to the Federal Farm Credit Board. His wife, Bonnie Mae Fox Clutter, born on January 7th, 1914. She had four kids, two of those which were adults. Beverly Clutter, who would be studying to become a nurse, and Evianna Clutter, who was married and living in Chicago, Illinois, and the two younger children, 16-year-old Nancy May Clutter and Kenyon Neil Clutter, 15. Bonnie was a very happy lady who did as much as possible to help the community, and she was also a part of a gardening club that she would attend regularly. She was well known in the community, as to the family as it was a small city where everyone knew everyone. The family was known as an upstanding family and wealthy family. Kenyon Neil Clutter, born August 28, 1944. He was a typical teenager, living in a small town in the 1950s. The youngest child of the family, the Clutter's only son. He was known to be quiet. He enjoyed hunting and working on old pickup trucks. His father would buy him a pickup truck to fix up, though he was too young to drive it. Nancy is only a year older than Kenyon, born on January 2nd, 1943. She was the youngest of the three daughters. She was a grade-A student with a perfect record. Nancy enjoyed horseback riding, baking, needlework, music and sewing. She was in a relationship with Bobby Rupp. She was attractive and attended church regularly. Kenyon and his sister Nancy had a loving brother and sister relationship. There were two more siblings, Beverly Clutter and Eviana Clutter, but they had married and moved away from home at this point to start their own families. The Clutter family were considered a loving and wholesome family that had a fate that they never saw coming. Richard Eugene Hickok grew up on a farm in Kansas City with his parents. Just like most teens, he dreamed of a college scholarship to play football. He was considered as a good athlete, a quite intelligent, but at the same time found it hard due to the fact he had a discipline problem. After his dream of a scholarship started to fade away after he was involved in a severe car accident in 1950, leaving his face permanently scarred and slightly lopsided. He would go on to have multiple jobs. He would work as a railroad worker, auto mechanic, and was also an ambulance driver. During this time, Richard would be married and have three kids. He would end up getting a divorce after his wife found out he was seeing another woman. After their divorce, he would go on to marry his mistress, this wouldn't work out and also end in divorce. Richard would then turn to petty theft to make money. He then got arrested after being caught writing bad checks. On March 15, 1958, he was sentenced to five years in the state penitentiary at Lansing, Kansas, for the burglary. Perry Edward Smith was born in Nevada, October 27, 1928. His parents would seek a career and fame on the rodeo circuit. His father was abusive and his mother was an alcoholic. Perry and his siblings all went through physical violence. His mother and father would soon separate and she took Smith and his siblings to San Francisco. Perry would be seven years old around this time. His mother would pass away from choking on her own vomit. Perry would be 13 years old. Due to his age and his father not being around, Perry would be sent to an orphanage. This wouldn't be a good experience for this young boy. He was verbally and physically abused by nuns because he would wet his bed. Smith described an instance where a superior tried to drown him. Two of his siblings committed suicide at a young age after leaving the Salvation Army's care. By 16, the teen had joined the United States Merchant Marine and later served in World War II and the Korean War. He was a troublemaker who enjoyed picking fights 
and in 1952 he was honourably discharged from the military. That same year, he would be arrested for reckless driving and resisting arrest. A little while later, he would be involved in a motorcycle accident. This accident would cause him to break both his legs that would leave him in hospital for six months, which left him in chronic pain. In July 1955, he would be arrested again for burglary in Phillips County, Kansas. He would be sent to jail, but soon after he would manage to escape. He would jump through a jail window and steal a car to make his getaway. He would be caught eventually, but released on a $10 bond. But once he got bond, he would disappear again. He would soon be identified as the escapee and would be taken back to jail. On March 13, 1956, he would be sentenced to five to ten years in the state penitentiary at Lansing for the burglary and the escape from jail. While incarcerated at Kansas State Prison, Hickok, who had been convicted for theft and Smith for burglary, would build a friendship. Hickok's prison record he kept clean and was actually noted down as a non-dangerous inmate. Towards the end of Smith's sentence, Hickok and Smith would share a cell in Lansing, but that would only last for two weeks, due to Smith being released on parole. Smith would get parole on July 6, 1959, with conditions in place, this being Smith not being allowed into the state of Kansas without supervision. He would move around staying in various people's homes and performing odd jobs. Once released, Hickok would be placed with a new cellmate by the name of Floyd Wells. Floyd was also incarcerated for theft. He was serving a sentence of three to five years. During the time Hickok and Wells were locked in a cell together, Wells would start to talk about a farm he used to work for as a farmhand owned by a man called Herbert Clutter. He claimed he was very wealthy and had a safe he kept at home that contained $10,000, which would probably estimate about $90,000 today. After hearing this, Hickok would assume the money was still there, start to think of a plan to rob this man. He would then start to ask Wells questions trying to gather as much information as possible. Wells would go on to let Hickok know that he knows that he keeps money because he pays his employees from the money kept in the safe. Hickok would ask about the property layout and how many people stayed at the home of the clutters. Hickok would say to Wells, As soon as I get out, I'm going straight over to the home of the clutters. I will kill the whole family, leaving no witnesses. Hickok would then write a letter to his former bunkmate Perry Smith, explaining that he needed his help with a situation when he is released from prison. Hickok would be released from prison sometime in early August 1959. He would stay with his parents. He would soon find a job working as an auto mechanic at a place called Bob Sands Garage. He would continue to write Smith explaining his ways to make money. Perry Smith would then go to Kansas, even though he wasn't allowed on his own to do so, and meet up with Hickok. Once back in contact, they would then begin to figure out a plan immediately to gain access to the cash. On the 14th of November 1959, they made their move and drove their black 1949 Chevrolet to the Clutter's home. The pair had collected the tools they needed for the robbery, including a shotgun, a flashlight, a fishing knife and some gloves. 400 miles later, they would stop at a gas station Phillips 66, a short drive after, not too far from the clutter home, Hickok did consider turning around and even suggested this to Perry Smith. But Perry Smith responded, Maybe you think I ain't got the guts to do it alone, but by God I'll show you who's got guts. Soon after, they would be outside the home of the clutter family, waiting for them to go to sleep. About 9pm, clutter had a telephone conversation with Gerald Van Vliet about general business. The clutter family would have a visitor, Bob Rupp, the boyfriend of Nancy, who would leave around 10.30pm. Shortly after midnight, they entered the house through an unlocked door. Hickok would be holding a knife and the flashlight while Smith would be holding a shotgun. They would search around the home looking for the safe containing the cash they came for. They remained silent as they searched the home but couldn't find the safe anywhere. They would then walk into the rooms of the family sleeping and wake them up. They would gather Bonnie, Nancy and Kenyon and put them all in the bathroom. They would grab Herb and take him to his office, telling him to tell them where the money is and the safe. Mr. Clutter would tell them that he didn't keep cash in his home. He would pay his employees by cheque. He said he would write them a cheque and they could take the little cash he had in his wallet. Smith and Hickok was not happy with this. They would then tie up Clutter, then make their way to the restroom and gather the other three Clutters. Bonnie would be placed in a room on the second floor with her hounds bound in front and her mouth gagged 
Nancy was tied, but with her hands behind her, her mouth was not gagged. They would then take Kenyon to where Herb was and take them both to the basement. They would tie and gag Kenyon here, but then, for some reason, decided to take him to the playroom, where he would be tied and gagged and placed on a couch. They placed a pillow behind his head. I'm gathering this was done to make him more comfortable. Herb was finally restrained. His mouth was gagged, and he was forced onto a mattress box resting on the furnace room's concrete floor. Once they had all been bound and gagged, Hickok would go upstairs and continue his search for the safe. Smith would remain with Mr. Clutter. On his search, he would find things such as a small transistor radio, a pair of binoculars, and $50 in cash, which would be worth around $440 today. Shortly after Hickok would come back downstairs, he was disappointed and very irate due to the fact he couldn't find the safe and thought that Mr. Clutter was holding information from him. They briefly discussed their options. The thieves decided that they would kill the family to avoid further imprisonment. One by one, the killing began. Perry would start the killing spree by cutting Herb Clutter's throat with the knife they brought along with them. Perry did originally tell Hickok to kill Herb, but he seemed incapable of doing this, so Perry would take the knife from him. After Perry cut his throat, he would stand up and shoot him in the head. Smith and Hickok would then make their way to where Kenyon was, and Smith would shoot him directly in the face while being restrained to a couch. The ex-convicts then headed upstairs, entering Nancy's room. She would beg not to be shot, but she was shot in the head. Lastly, Bonnie Clutter was killed by a gunshot wound to the side of the head. The Clutter family all received a single shotgun shot to the head or face except for Herb Clutter, who would have his throat slit first. The robbers and now murderers would make sure to collect all the shotgun shells, then fled the scene with the few items they stole, the small transistor radio, a pair of binoculars and $50 in cash. While trying to figure out their next move, they would move around the city of Kansas writing hot checks. Hours later, the bodies of the Clutter family were found by two of Nancy's classmates, Susan, and a friend with the same name, Nancy. They would be driven there by their parents, Mr. and Mrs. Clarence Ewalt, as they normally go to church together. Initially, they would knock but get no answer. They would then leave and make their way to another friend that would also attend church with them, Mrs. Wilma Kidwell. And to see if there was any contact from the Clutter family, Mrs. Kidwell would say she had not heard from them, which made them all return to the home of the Clutters. Shortly after 9am, the two classmates Nancy and Susan would go to the door and notice it was unlocked. They entered the house. They would go straight to Nancy's room and witness the gruesome scene. The girls would come running out the house screaming. The police would then be called from a neighbour's home. The police of Garden City would arrive to the Clutters' home around 10am. As the police searched through the house, they would come across Herb Clutter, 48, lay sprawled on a mattress in the basement, his throat slashed, and a shotgun charge fired to his head. He wore pyjamas, his hands were bound, and his mouth was taped shut. On a couch in an adjoining room was 15-year-old Kenyon Neil Clutter, bound, gagged, and shot in the head. In separate upstairs bedrooms were the bodies of Mrs. Bonnie May Clutter, 45, and Nancy May Clutter, 16. Mrs. Clutter was bound and gagged. Nancy was only bound. Each had been shot in the head. There were no signs of a struggle. Looking around, they noticed that the phone lines had been cut. Soon, the house filled with more police, the Kansas City Bureau of Investigation, doctors, a minister, reporters, and their photographers. Chief Mitchell Geisler was one of the first officers to arrive to the horrific scene. Accompanying him was Assistant Chief Rich Rolleder, Rolleder was an expert photographer and used his skills to photograph the crime scene. It was through Rolleder's photographs that the discovery of a bloody footprint remained from Smith. This footprint was not visible to the naked eye. Once the photos from the crime scene had been developed, the team made a discovery. Under ultraviolet light, a boot print was visible in the images. A photograph was also taken of a tyre track left in haste by the murders. The Kansas Highway Patrol set up a roadblock at the entrance of the long lane to the Clutter home shortly after the sheriff's arrival and kept the public from the scene. Shortly after the discovery, Reverend Leonard Cowan, pastor of the Methodist Church, would be called to the home. He returned to the church in time to start the morning worship service at 10.45, made a brief announcement about the tragedy. He would then leave the pulpit to call the two surviving daughters. 
the bodies would be removed from the home around noon. Alvin Dewey from the KBI had become acquaintances with Herb over the years and began to assemble his task force to find the people who had murdered his friend. He would be the one to lead the investigation. He would call for extra help from four other KBI investigators working under him. He also solicited the support of other governmental agencies to develop evidence and leads. There would be a total of 18 people working on the case. A reward of $1,000 for information leading to the whereabouts of the killer. Immediately following the murders, Hickok and Smith fled to the Kansas City area, where Hickok wrote a series of hot checks. They didn't have the law hot on their trail, and there were no wanted posters with drawings of their faces covering convenience store bulletin boards. In fact, no one even knew who they were yet. But they were on the run. After overstaying their welcome, they decided to flee to Mexico, where they stayed for a short period of time. There they pawned the stolen items and eventually hitchhiked their way through California to Omaha, Nebraska. After a short stay in Omaha, they made their way to Iowa, where they stole a car and returned to the Kansas City area. From Kansas City, they eventually traveled to Florida and Nevada. A few weeks later, a colleague, Alvin Logan Sanford, the director of the KBI in Topeka, called Dewey to tell him that Floyd Wells, a former prisoner at Kansas State Prison, had ratted them out. He knew who the killers were and was willing to talk in return for the reward money and early release from prison. It was in Nevada on December 31st, 1959. The pair, Smith and Hickok, were picking up a parcel containing personal belongings that Smith had shipped from Mexico. Among the items were the boots worn during the murders. Local police would notice the car 30 minutes later and run the plates and found it had been stolen in Iowa. They picked the men up and arrested them for the vehicle theft. Once word got out that they had been captured, Dewey and three other KBI investigators flew to Nevada. Smith and Hickok were flown from Nevada to Garden City in Kansas, where they were separately questioned by Dewey and his team. Both eventually confessed to the murders of the family, though Hickok always argued that Smith killed all four people, not him. Hickok admitted to hearing a gurgling noise as Smith slit Mr. Cutter's throat before shooting him in the head. Smith asserted that he had stopped Hickok from raping Nancy. Hickok, 29, would tell investigators that he and Smith, 31, travelled 10,000 miles over the course of six weeks after the Kansas murders, crisscrossing the country, heading to Mexico, getting into little adventures, just trying to stay alive. After the confession, the prisoners were retained at the Finney County Jail in Garden City. They were kept on two separate wings. Each cell contained a cot, a toilet, a shower stall, a chair, and a table on which they could eat their meals. Smith kept a diary in a loose-leaf notebook, which included doodles and caricatures. Smith had little company, as his family seemed to have disowned him. Hickok occupied his time by reading. Hickok's family visited him often. Their trial was held at the Finney County Courthouse in Garden City. Public turnout was significant, but with a capacity of 160 people in the third floor courtroom, the benches filled fast and many people were turned away. Up front were the press members, including a young novelist and reporter named Truman Capote, who was on assignment from the New Yorker newspaper. Clutter's daughters, Beverly and Aviana, did not attend any sessions as the event was too brutal. However, Herbert's brother Arthur Clutter was there and told reporters, the way I feel I could tear them apart. Over the next three days, witnesses were called for the prosecution. These included those who had discovered the bodies, the sheriff, county coroner, police investigators, KBI agents, forensic experts, and Floyd Wells, Hickok's former cellmate. They would provide the evidence they had, the knife and the shotgun that was found at the home of Hickok's parents, the photo of the bloody shoe print, the boots found in the possession of the two when arrested. They had also retrieved the stolen radio and binoculars they had sold to the pawn shop in Mexico, Due to their own confessions, they would even find the shotgun shells used in the murder. Though the defence tried hard to discredit some of the evidence, they had little to work with. On March 29, 1960, within an hour, the jury would return a verdict of guilty of four counts of first-degree murder. They were then sentenced to death. The pair were then sent to the Kansas State Penitentiary in Lansing, Kansas, northwest of Kansas City. The hangings were first set for May 13, 1960, 
but defence attorneys started a series of legal battles that resulted in the executions being reset for October 25th, 1962. Then August 8th, 1963. Then February 18th, 1965. And then for April 14th, 1965. For the next five years, they lived on death row. The next five years were long. Smith staged a four months hunger strike in 1960. Both he and Hickok, impatient with their attorneys, wrote individual appeals to the courts. Various lawyers tried all legal avenues to win a reversal of the case. Nothing succeeded. During this five years, Perry Smith would speak with an ex-army friend, Don Cullivan. Mr. Cullivan said, he said, As I pulled the trigger, there was a flash of blue light. I could see his head split open. Hickok and Smith ate their final meal in separate rooms, each with a chaplain sitting by. They had ordered spiced shrimp, french fries, garlic bread, ice cream and strawberries with whipped cream. On April 14, 1965, they were hanged at the gallows in Kansas State Penitentiary. Hickok was executed first. As Hickok waited for the trap to spring beneath him, the prison chaplain, Reverend Edgar Meisner, read a portion of the 23rd Psalm. As Smith waited, the Reverend James Post, former prison chaplain, prayed quietly, The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed is the name of the Lord. May the Lord have mercy on your soul. Later, the Reverend Mr. Post said Smith had not wanted anything read over him. I cheated him a little bit, the former chaplain added. He was pronounced dead at 12.41 a.m. Smith followed shortly afterward and was pronounced dead at 1.19 a.m. Smith's last words were, I think it is a hell of a thing that a life has to be taken in this manner. I say this especially because there's a great deal I could have offered society. I certainly think capital punishment is legally and morally wrong. Any apology for what I have done would be meaningless at this time. I don't have any animosities toward anyone involved in this matter. I think that is all. The last words of Hickok were, No, I guess I don't. However, he then motioned for KBI agent Roy Church, who played a significant role in the arrest of the two men, to come to him and said, You're sending me to a better place than this. He then shook hands and said, Goodbye. They were both buried in Mount Muncie Cemetery in Lansing, Kansas. As Karma Floyd Wells, the prisoner that told Hickok and Smith about the clutters and then ratted them out, was later killed himself in a prison break in Mississippi. Although Holcomb has grown over the years to just over 2,000 residents, the murders still haunt the little town even though the killers were caught within six weeks of the brutal murders. R.I.P. The Clutter Family, Herb Clutter, Bonnie May Fox Clutter, Nancy May Clutter and Kenyon Neil Cutter. May you all rest in eternal peace. Until next time, like, comment and subscribe, and also follow on Instagram at official page of crime. Also on TikTok at page of crime.